along and here we are uh, once again as we come to our discussion of the Jewish roots of the Christian faith. We're glad that you've chosen to join us here on FATV. Invite your friends for the next few broadcasts because we're going to have a great time explaining the uh, festivals of God that we're about. It's God's season. You know in the, in the book of Leviticus it states that uh, these are my festivals. In Leviticus chapter 23 as God begins to go through his pattern, his calendar. You see, God has a calendar, and his calendar doesn't look quite like the Christian calendar that you and I are used to. Uh, the first thing he marks in his calendar, by the way, is Shabbat, which is from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday, and this is his day. Uh, you can have all the other days you want, but he calls that his day, and in fact, the prophets tell us that during the millennial reign of Christ, that thousand years after Messiah returns and reigns in the world from Jerusalem, a thousand years of peace on planet Earth, uh, that we will be celebrating Shabbat. Sunday will be a thing of the past, and Shabbat will be the thing of that thousand years. And in Leviticus chapter 23, Yahweh goes on to reveal uh, his plan of redemption. And the calendar that we know uh, from Leviticus is a redemption calendar. Uh, we start with Passover and we go through the, the festivals that are speaking of the event of Yeshua the Messiah. Passover certainly uh, reflecting the offering of his life. But then we come to a whole different set of calendars and that would be the calendar uh, called the civil calendar or the year that the civil community functions. And actually, the rabbis will tell us that the calendar that begins on Rosh Hashanah is marking the years from the uh, creation of man forward. So we have a creation calendar, and we have a uh, redemptive calendar. The redemption calendar is speaking about the Messiah who's going to come. He's going to uh, live his life among us to teach us. He's going to come and lay his life down. And all of those prophecies uh, embodied in the acting out of Passover and first fruits and, and um, Shavuot when the Holy Spirit came, all, all of those have been fulfilled with the coming of Yeshua. But when we look to the fall feast, when we look to Rosh Hashanah, when we look to Yom Kippur and then that really great celebration of Sukkot, uh, we're now looking at a time that is yet to be. So in God's redemption calendar, it tells us what was going to happen with Yeshua and then what yet will happen uh, with the second coming of Yeshua. And so we, we see the redemption played out uh, in a calendar that speaks of things to come. In the civil calendar, God, in essence, is talking about the lease of planet Earth to mankind. For you see, God said to Adam, I give this planet to you. I give you dominion. Uh, you have authority. You go forth. You multiply. You have the authority of planet Earth. God created man not simply to be a slave, but he created Adam and Eve to be co-laborers with Yahweh, to work with him molding this planet and, and forming this planet to be uh, the best that it could. This was God's conception, God's plan, that I'll have a partner in Adam, a partner in Eve, and with me, uh, we will create planet Earth uh, as this utopia, as this world that is the best manifestation of the goodness of God. But we all know the story, and the story of the fall, and the story of Hasatan, who came and tempted Eve, and then Adam lended his authority as the one who had that authority uh, in violating God's law, what they actually did was turn the authority of planet Earth over to Satan. Now, Satan doesn't get that rule forever and ever and ever because Adam and Eve did not have that forever and ever, but they were given a lease of the planet. When you lease property to somebody, that they have that planet for uh, that property for the as long as the lease goes, but when the lease runs out, then all of a sudden it reverts to the owner. 
And there's a, a lease that most uh, prophecy teachers believe is a 6,000 year lease, whereby uh, mankind is given control of the planet for 6,000 years, and then at the end of that 6,000 years, uh, the heavens will be rent, Yeshua will return, judgment will take place, individuals will be judged, but also the nations of the world will be judged. And there will be that period of time then when on planet Earth there will be a, a massive reconstruction going. Uh, there will still be people living here. Uh, there will be the saints of God ruling and reigning here. And there'll be a thousand years of peace. Now the Bible tells us that at the end of that thousand years there'll be one last great rebellion. If you think the description of Armageddon is bad, you can imagine that no matter how good, and think about it, 1,000 years of peace never happened. We haven't even had 100 years of peace on planet Earth. 1,000 years of peace uh, where the blessings of God are flowing, and yet at the end of that 1,000 years, there will still be human beings on this plant, planet that resent the rule of God. Think about that. 1,000 years of peace and yet when Satan is unleashed one last time, he's able to gather forces with him of people who oppose the peaceful rule, the shalom, that Yeshua brings from Jerusalem. Uh, that'll be a very short uh, rebellion. And after that, I didn't mean to get in teaching prophecy, but, uh, but I think it will be helpful to you. After that, there will be a new heaven and earth. Pe people sometimes... Uh, mistake the, uh, the tribulation and the thousand-year reign of Christ. They, they mistakenly assume that the new heaven and earth are at the end of the tribulation. No, no, we have planted earth as it is, uh, except we're going to have the wisdom and the skills and the knowledge, and we'll have the lack of war. So, you know, we'll be able to do all the things required to make this planet an exceedingly a clean and prosperous place. Uh, the, the, those who are interested in saving the trees have no idea what the planet's going to look like during that thousand year reign. But at the end of that thousand years of peace is when the Bible says that Yahweh's going to roll up the heavens like a scroll. Uh, just like you would finish reading a scroll and you would roll it up and put it back in its container. The Bible says that the heavens and the earth are going to be rolled up like a scroll. The universe, as you and I know it, <laughs> is literally going to be rolled. I mean, that, think about that sometime if you have nothing else to do with your pea-sized brain. That the, that the universe will begin to wrap up on itself and God will tuck it away. And the Bible says there will be a new heaven that would be a new universe and there'll be a, a brand new earth. So for the thousand years, we're reconstructing, remodeling this one. But at the end of the thousand years, when the last judgment has taken place, and all that is evil has been totally eliminated forever and ever, and ever and ever and ever, uh, God will celebrate that with a brand new universe. Now, I don't know about you, but I think the one he created is pretty fascinating. Amen? I, I think it's pretty awesome. And to think that at that point, we're going to have a brand new universe. We can't even imagine uh, what it will look like. Uh, I personally believe it will be more of a multiverse, as uh, physicists today like to talk about the multiple dimensions, and we'll understand them all. Now, I don't know how I got off on all that, other than to tell you God has a calendar. God has everything under control. And, and God's planned his calendar a lot longer than you've been around. Think about that. The Bible says that, that before the creation of the world, uh, you were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. God, God sits outside the dimension of time, and so he's not watching your life to see what you're going to do with it. He already knows what you're going to do with it. The goodness and, and, and graciousness of God is that God continues to pour his blessing into humanity even when he knows that humanity will not receive it. But, but God sits outside of time 
And he speaks into this world, and therefore his words themselves uh, create time. And so in Leviticus, actually we can go back to Genesis chapter 1, God says, I'm putting signs in the heaven. I'm putting the sun, I'm putting the moon, and I'm putting all the stars in the heavens so that they can be signs for my appointed time. So God has appointed times. Yeshua was born on time. In the fullness of time. Is that not what the writers of Scripture say? In the fullness of time. The angel Gabriel came to Mary, Miriam, uh, and spoke to her. And she said, be it unto me as God, Yahweh, wills. And she becomes impregnated by Holy Spirit. And that which is born of of her womb, therefore, is called Emmanuel, God with us. God, God planned that. He planned that time and, and, and invaded human history. Well, God has plans for your time and my time as well. Uh, think about it. I believe we are the last generation on planet Earth before the great unfolding of the end times begins to happen. That means that God planned for you to be alive during this time. Think about it. God planned for you to be here. God, God knew that we'd be in, in Fitchburg, Massachusetts. God knew that we'd be on, on 40 Bow Tell Street. God knew before this synagogue first built its first building here that we would be here. And when they uh, tore down that building and rebuilt the one we're in now as a, as a Jewish synagogue, God knew that we'd be in it, in here. He, he knew the synagogue would come to a time when there would not be enough Jewish participants to keep it alive as a synagogue. And, and so God worked in our lives to bring us to be the ones to carry the tradition on. Uh, some of you may remember when we started over in a little storefront over in Westminster. When we started, we weren't thinking of our Jewish roots. We weren't you know, we weren't thinking of Shabbat. We weren't thinking of the festivals and the Moeds. You know, we were a pretty typical evangelical Bible-believing group of believers that got together, and, and, but we made a decision to follow God. And God started us over in that little place, in that little storefront. He started us to begin to understand the nature of the Jewish roots. Very primitive understandings, I must Admit, I think some of it was more around our singing of Messianic Jewish songs uh, than anything else. But you see, God was grooming us back then for here. Think about that. God was working in our lives individually to, to birth an awareness of the Jewish roots of the Christian faith back there so that when the time came, that the synagogue needed to be transferred into the hands of another organization, he would have ready those people who would appreciate the depth of what this building means. And those people who would understand that the very walls of this sanctuary are filled with the words of Torah having been read Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath. And if there's any difference it may be that we now take the voice of those roots and we speak them into the community. And so when you're listening on FATV, this is the result of what God has done. That God is trying to, to get a message into not just our congregation and not just into the churches of the world, but into the communities of the world. That God has a plan, that God has a purpose. God has a nation. It's called Israel. God has a people, they're called the Jews. And when we as Christians have come into relationship with Yeshua the Messiah, the Apostle Paul says, we as Gentiles were supposed to be grafted in to the Jewish people. That's a word that, that needs to be spoken in a state, in a commonwealth, in a community, uh, in a nation, and in a world that is becoming increasingly anti-Semitic. That God has a people. And we are meant to be part of that people. Yeshua himself said, 
that part of the blessings that will come were the blessings that he says, when you did these things to the least of my brethren, you did them for me. When you visited me and when I was in prison, you fed me, you took care of me, you did all these things. And, and people are shocked and say, well, when did we ever see you that way? And he says, when you did it to the least of my brethren. And then there's a whole bunch of people, and that's a scary thought. There's a whole bunch of people that Yeshua says, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was in prison, you, you didn't visit me. You know, when I needed your help, you were not there to assist me. And, and so you're going to be excluded from the millennial kingdom. Wow. And when they say, Lord, when will we ever see you that way? He says, when you didn't do that for the least of my brethren. So the simple question that the Western Gentile-minded church has overlooked is, who were Yeshua's brethren? Who are his brothers? And, and, and unless you have a Norwegian Jesus with blonde hair and blue eyes as your, your image that you grew up with, he was a Middle Eastern Jewish man. And when he said to everybody there, when you've done it to the least of my brethren, who do you think they all understood he meant? He meant his Jewish brethren. Whether they're in or out of the kingdom, they're his brothers. And to the extent that you and I will understand, appreciate, applaud and support and come behind and undergird Yeshua's brethren to that extent, you become favored in his eyes. He looks upon you with favor when you do that. To the extent that you or I become the persecutor of the Jew, the, the critic of Israel, Eretz Israel, Yeshua's land, to the extent that you and I, even by our silence, refuse to stand up and speak in behalf, to that extent we have put a gap between us and the Lord of the Christian church. And that's why Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, uh, went out of his way to talk about the fact of how do we fit in? How do we, how do we get into end of the church? And even when the early church in Acts chapter 15 was struggling with that, that whole image of, well, what does a Gentile have to believe to become part? And more importantly, well, do you have to be circumcised to be part of the a part of this new community called the Messianic community of Yeshua the Messiah. And many people thought you did, and, and most Gentiles don't even understand the question because the question really wasn't one of circumcision. It was one of, do you have to be circumcised according to the rabbi's teaching? We, we missed the whole battle that was going on in that early Christian community, Christian and Jew. They weren't even called Christians, and they were called followers of the way, or followers of Yeshua. And, and so the Jerusalem council got together, and what they really said was, you do not have to follow the rabbinic teachings to be part of the Messianic Jewish community. And yet today, people will say, well, the, the, the council in Acts chapter 15 said, you don't have to do any of that Jewish stuff. Well, I suggest you read Acts chapter 15 and don't let your pastor or preacher or teacher or favorite prophetic teacher who doesn't line up with the Word of God tell you otherwise. Read it for yourself. Acts chapter 15. No, what the Jerusalem Council said is, we're not going to lay all these laws on them that even we couldn't bear. What were the laws? It was not the Torah that was laid on them they couldn't bear. It was the rabbinic codes that were laid on top of that. It was the oral traditions. And so... Uh, the Jerusalem Council said, no, what they need to do is there's four things they need to do, and you can look those up, find the four. They all come out of the book of Leviticus. They all have to do with the ability of a Gentile to fellowship with, a, with an Orthodox Jew. But then the, James and the council made this amazing statement. The reason they only need these four things, because that's the starter. But they'll be taught the rest because they'll be going to synagogue every Sabbath. So the assumption was that the Gentiles didn't have to, you know, start looking like a Jew, but they should be showing up at the synagogue every Shabbat and being taught the what? The Torah. That was the instructions to the Gentiles 
throughout the Middle East. Churches turned that all around and said, we don't want to have anything to do with, with Jewishness. Now, here's the problem. When the, when the church began to turn away, and when I say turn away, what happened was that uh, by the tens and maybe even hundreds of thousands, Gentiles wanted to receive Yeshua as Messiah, and, and they began to overwhelm by sheer numbers the Jewish brethren, and so they began to elect their own as leaders. And after the apostles died out, we have this sudden rush into the vacuum of supposedly learned church fathers who go about bringing their pagan theology into Christianity. And part of what they did is said, we're setting aside the Jewish calendar because we don't want to be Jews. And we're going to institute a calendar that's more conducive to us, makes us feel more at home. Now, this is a problem in, in any nation. If you come to America, you should come to understand what the 4th of July is about. If you prefer not to celebrate the 4th of July, you prefer not to fly the American flag, you prefer uh, not to study our Constitution, you prefer not to adopt our ways, but you want to stand outside, you want to have your flag, your beliefs, everything else, and, and you think America should be like that, you're wrong. You know, find a country where you can go that believes like you do, that, that has Sharia law like you want, that, that has the flag you want. But when you come to be part of us, you need to be part of us. But see, this is simply a reflection of what happened in the Gentile church. I, I believe that we're, as a nation, at the most crucial time in American history. And many pastors like me have been saying over the past months, and will increasingly say that the fault of where America is belongs at the doorstep of the church. But I think it belongs at the church way hundreds of years ago, not just now. Because the church accepted and adopted that it is okay to believe something other than the Bible. And even though the Protestant Reformation said, sola scriptura, we only go by the scriptures. The truth of the matter is that the church doesn't, in its practice, go by the, church, by the Bible. It actually doesn't even go by the New Testament in its practice. Because the New Testament Christians were Sabbath keepers. They were Sabbath worshipers. So when the church said, we only believe in the scripture, I'm not talking about their theology. I'm talking about, are they doing what the Word of God says? And in order to do it, they've got to take the bulk of the Bible. If I were to take it in uh, mine right here right now, it's roughly this much is Torah and this much is the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament. You've got to take the old and throw it out. Even though the old is the foundation of the new. Even though all the gifts of the Spirit manifested in a church that didn't even have this. That when Paul taught everything you need to know to be a baptized Christian, to be a tongue-talking Christian, to be a power-filled Christian, to see miracles as a Christian, you can get it all out of the old because they didn't have the new in the first hundred years of the church. I mean, think about that. But because we set in place a policy to get rid of it, what did we get rid of? We got rid of the calendar of God. Now, I don't know about you, but there's certain days I like to celebrate. And you know, growing up, I always thought birthdays were a great, a great day to, to celebrate. I, I, I like birthdays because you know, I didn't have to share it with anyone else. Actually, I had a cousin who was born on my birthday, but you know, unless we were in the same community at the same time, you know, she was celebrating in one state and I was in another. Christmas, you share with everybody. Thanksgiving, you share with everybody. New Year's, you share with everybody. But May 16th was my birthday. It was my birthday, and it was kind of neat. Now, I, I usually, growing up, would, my, my mom would have a party for my friends and everything. And can you imagine, I, I have a party, and I invite, you know, 20, 20 of my friends to come over for the day. We're having a cookout. It's Don's 16th birthday. We're having a celebration. And you come two days later. 
Now you show up two days later and I say to you, well, the, we already had the party. Well, do you have any leftover hamburgers? Are you kidding? <laughs> there's, not a, there's not a scrap of food left over. You know, 18 of us ate everything. We didn't save anything for you two. You just didn't show up. It's not that the parable of Yeshua when he talks about the virgins. He talks about ten virgins who are ready for the bridegroom to come, and five are ready. They got their oil, they got their lamps, they got other... But the other five, they're just involved in life, and they're like, oh, well, when he comes, he comes. And all of a sudden, the shofar sounds, and the bridegroom shows up, and, and he says, gather your lamps and come into the bridal party. And the five that don't have oil, you know, they've now got to run out and try to find it. But while they're trying to find it, the five who have the oil light their lamps and go in with the bridegroom, and the door is shut. That doesn't seem very fair. Well, it's the Bible. There are appointed times. There are appointed times. And because God goes to the trouble to say, these are my appointed moeds, my appointed times, don't you think it would be wise that we pay more attention to God's appointed time than some pagan festivals that have crept into Christianity, put on a veneer as if they're Christian, but even that veneer no longer stands. So the church that can celebrate Easter, which is a pagan holiday, Christmas, which is a pagan holiday, Halloween, for Pete's sakes, which is definitely a pagan holiday, but not celebrate Rosh Hashanah, the blowing of the trumpet, not even understand what it's about, sit in a church all their life and never be told what it's about, or they can come to Yom Kippur, the the Day of Atonement, and say, well, that's a Jewish thing, are going to find out that when we stand in eternity, God is going to say, that was my appointed day, and I had something planned for your life, but you wouldn't show up. Think about it. We, we don't show up. We don't know what we're missing because we don't even know there was a party. Glory to God. So in, in our next broadcast on FATV, we're going to start looking at these feasts that are coming up uh, in this season, of this fall season, uh, beginning to look at um, Yom Teruah, which is the blowing of the shofars, and then we'll look at Yom Kippur in Sukkot. And you don't want to miss them because these are God's appointments. And on our regular calendar, they're coming up right around the corner here in October. Well, this is Pastor Don Long. I'm sure glad you chose to join us. I hope I've kind of tricked your thinking into, into getting hungry so that you say, mm, I want to get back and find out what God's appointments are all about.